first of all, I just want to uh, thank the organizers for uh, doing this great job. I've done it once, and it's really hard work. Um, and it's been a little bit since I've uh, been at DEPCONF, and it's really so, so nice to be back here. Um, for those that don't know who I am, um, Gabriella, people call me Biella, and I've spent about the last 10 years um, looking at different hacker communities, and my first project was on free and open source software with a big focus on Debian. And it, it kind of culminated in a book called Coding Freedom, The Ethics and Aesthetics of Hacking, which is available under a Creative Commons license if you haven't checked it out. Uh, I was a pretty kind of regular at DebConf, um, but for the last number of years, I got lost in a wormhole. Um, and it was a bit of a fun wormhole. It was a bit of a scary wormhole. And I feel like I've actually only gotten out of the wormhole literally about 10 days ago. Um, and that's because I finished this book uh, completely in about August 10th. And uh, the wormhole was looking at anonymous and studying anonymous. And uh, it really took a, a huge amount of my time and effort and emotions. And compared to something like uh, Debian, was a much, much tougher puzzle uh, to crack. And the, the talk I'm giving today is primarily about anonymous. And you may be wondering, what does anonymous have to do with Debian or free software? And at one level, it, it kind of has nothing to do with these. But at another level, it actually does have a lot to do with free software and hacker politics and also the questions of access and openness. And I wasn't really uh, planning on giving a talk, um, in part because I was exhausted while I was traveling through this wormhole for three years. Uh, but some folks suggested that since I went to this um, other galaxy and I've emerged uh, back, that I should give a talk about it. And what I'm going to do today is uh, focus quite a bit on Anonymous, but I'm going to try to make some connections uh, between them and open source and also contextualize uh, Anonymous within the sort of flourishing of hacker politics that we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, my talk um, has a warning. We're entering a politically incorrect uh, zone. All personnel entering the premises will encounter a thing called freedom of speech. Uh, and in fact, Anonymous is quite known for their offensive speech. And um, I will admit that Anonymous will be uh, violating the code of conduct um, uh, because of their offensive speech. I think that they would be very happy to hear that they are violating the code of conduct. If you are concerned with adult language or expletives, and this is a problem, um, you might you know, want to leave. I don't actually think it's going to be too much of a problem, uh, but I think it's important to mention it, mention it at the start of the talk. So um, the talk is divided into three parts. Uh, how is it that Anonymous uh, turned to activism? It's a very interesting story. A uh, second part, which is about their sociology, their politics, uh, their political significance. And then finally, I'm going to get to weapons of the geek and uh, talk about the broader milieu. Uh, but to start, we're going to start with the question of an accident and the accident, because I really do think that Anonymous is a tale about a crazy aberration, perhaps one of the weirdest political accidents ever to have occurred. Now, this is not unusual to Anonymous only. Even free software at, at some level has these accidental elements. And so, for example, when um, Richard Stallman dreamed up the idea of free software and uh, eventually architected a legal uh, uh, element to free software. He didn't envision free software to be a kind of global collaborative project, and it was Linus Torvalds who accidentally initiated that, right? So these are pretty common things in the history of, of politics. But as we'll see in a moment, I think the accident was really on overdrive with Anonymous. A good place to start is in 2007. Fox News featured Anonymous one evening in a general news segment, and they called uh, anonymous hackers on steroids. Um, a bit hyperbolic. Um, and then they also called them the internet hate machine as well, which was a term that 
Anonymous kind of embraced, um, somewhat ironically, but not entirely ironically either. The question is, was Fox News being um, just colorful? Were they exaggerating as Fox News often does, right? Well, yes and no. Um, Fox News was reporting on Anonymous because at the time, in 2007, Anonymous was purely a kind of trolling outfit. Uh, they were really well known for causing discordia, for uh, choosing targets to humiliate them. Uh, and a lot of the activity came out of 4chan.org. And if you haven't been there, please enter at your own uh, risk. And this trolling activity was done for the lulls, for the laughter, uh, to take pleasure in the suffering of others. And Anonymous was only known uh, for this activity. Now, as an academic, um, I strive for some precision in my uh, definitions and actually think that one definition provided by Anonymous as to what trolling is really captures the, the spirit of trolling. And that's uh, ultra-coordinated motherfuckery. So that's what they were doing from about 2004, uh, pretty much until 2008. So one example of one of their trolling raids um, was done against Habbo Hotel. Habbo Hotel is a social networking site that is popular in Finland among the youth, apparently. Um, and Anonymous once engaged in a trolling raid where they created a bunch of avatars where everyone was um, you know, African-American with afros and suits, and they blocked access to the pool uh, because the pool had a uh, AIDS and fail. Um, and this is classically you know, extremely offensive uh, in what Anonymous did. This was in uh, 2006. Now, what's interesting actually about the Habbo Hotel raids was there was actually a slight political sensibility. Uh, there were rumors that the moderators in Habbo Hotel were blocking avatars if they were dark. Uh, so they were using very offensive means to, to protest Habbo Hotel. But it was primarily about trolling. So now let's uh, fast forward. Um, to today, literally today, last week, when Anonymous is now a name used primarily to instigate revolution, protests around the world. And uh, in order uh, for me, I'd like to actually show you an example related to one of their most recent operations, which relates to Operation Ferguson in Ferguson, Missouri. And uh, this operation concerns a young African-American man, Mike Brown, who was shot six times by a police officer. And Anonymous uh, swooped in and they do what they do now, which is engage in distributed denial of service attacks uh, and hacking. But they're also very well known for helping to organize protests and create videos to kind of raise political awareness and consciousness. So let me now play about one minute of a video that they created for Operation Ferguson. You know, within 24 hours of Robin Williams' death, we knew more about what happened than we've learned in four days since the very public shooting of Mike Brown. No, 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 no. There, there it goes there, now firing onto the crowd. You just, you just said to me on air, media do not pass us. You're getting mace next time you pass us. They're threatening to mace you. Yes. Uh, media do not pass us. You're getting mace next time you pass us. The tear gap is pretty, is pretty thick. Greetings citizens of the United States, we are anonymous, in recent light of the situation in Ferguson, Missouri, where the people's right to protest has been usurped by an illegal curfew and the deployment of the National Guard, we're committed to stand hand in hand with the people in Ferguson, where peaceful protesters have been arrested, journalists threatened and the right to protest criminalized using jammers to disrupt communication of live streamers, letting plumb rule the streets like dictators in the Middle East to hurt people, no-fly zone. In a word a military force, will not ensure peace and justice in Ferguson. J. Nixon, this is not democracy, this may be your right but not your right to fight us and that's what why the dosage of online and offline protest will continue. So that's pretty remarkable I think, to go from 
these, you know, extremely offensive trolls that are all about pranking to this, which is about protests and uh, political awareness. And this is just one example of over 200 operations that Anonymous has been involved in in the last number of years. So, for example, they were involved in the Arab Spring. They were one of the first kind of outside groups to report on Tunisia in January 2011, shuttling and gophering videos out of the country to the Western media. They were an informal protest, uh, or I mean public relations wing for the Occupy movement. Um, and Anonymous is quite well known to be triggered into action uh, when it comes to any sort of internet-y issue or censorship issue. So, for example, they were quite involved in stopping SOPA, um, which is about uh, piracy, and engage quite extensively. So the question is, how did these trolls uh, pivot towards activism, right? And one of the fascinating things is that it really has a lot to do with Tom Cruise. Um, we have Tom Cruise to thank for Anonymous. And what happened, and, and really because he believes in Zeno, that is really part of it, because really what happened was that there was this video. Cruise has brought to this world, there still remains one more word on the man. Call it Tom Cruise on Tom Cruise Scientologist. I think it's a privilege to call yourself a Scientologist, and it's something that you have to earn. And because a Scientologist does, he or she has the ability to create new and better realities and improve conditions. Uh, being a Scientologist, you look at someone and you know absolutely that you can help them. Okay, so that video was leaked by Little A Anonymous. It was members of the Church of Scientology who were critical of the church who got the video out. This church was meant only for internal consumption for Scientology members. It spread like wildfire, and uh, news establishments like Gawker uh, published the video. And Scientology is known for its very litigious nature, and so they got out their... Um, they got out their lawyers, and their lawyers threatened uh, websites like Gawker with lawsuits. And once they did that, Anonymous, the trolling outfits, like, hey, what a perfect target. Let's troll the heck out of the Church of Scientology. And to this day, it's probably their mothership trolling raid. I mean, basically, they DDoSed every website related to Scientology. They sent hundreds of pizzas to Scientology churches across the country. Um, they pranked the Dianetics hotline. Uh, they scanned their you know, butts um, and then sent faxes of their butts uh, to churches. These sorts of things. They had a great time uh, doing it. And as part of this trolling raid, they created a video. And the video was done for the sake of the lulls. And it was a very important video. And now I want to show you. Leaders of Scientology. A second, we are anonymous. Uh, a few Over the ago. years, we have been watching you, your campaigns of misinformation, your suppression of dissent, your litigious nature. All of these things have caught our eye. With the leakage of your latest propaganda video into mainstream circulation, the extent of your malign influence over those who have come to trust you as leaders has been made clear to us. Anonymous has therefore decided that your organization should be destroyed. For the good of your followers, for the good of mankind and for our own enjoyment, we shall proceed to expel you from the internet and systematically dismantle the Church of Scientology in its present form. We recognize you as serious opponents. And Okay, so this video also took off. Uh, it was like wildfire. And the interesting thing is that within Anonymous, it helps spur a debate. And the debate was, shall we stay faithful to our madcap roots and continue to be these, you know, gnarly internet trolls? Or should we actually earnestly protest the Church of Scientology? I mean, this is truly a debate that started to happen uh, after this video and after some critics of the church also said, hey, you guys are kind of powerful. Why don't you jump aboard this ship of kind of protest and activism? Well, they made a decision, and the decision came in the form of a global day of protests on February uh, 10th, 2008, where over 7,000 geeks and nerds showed up across um, 127 cities in front of Scientology 
um, churches and protested. And it was really interesting. I went to the protests in New York City, and it was pretty clear that, first of all, a lot of these like internet nerds came from 4chan, and 4chan truly is kind of anonymous, and they just wanted to meet other kind of people from 4chan. Uh, but on the other hand, what also happened was that the media validation that they got, uh, as well as just the feeling of empowerment when you kind of hit the streets, was enough to constitute a new activist project, a long-term activist project. And it went by the name of Operation Chinology. And this was the kind of name of the anonymous operation that started to earnestly target the Church of Scientology, and people from Anonymous every month started to protest the church. Now is time for a slight detour. How is it that I kind of got involved, right? These things were happening, uh, but why was it that it caught my attention? Well, I'm going to confess I myself have had a relationship with Xenu. And it happened in 2007 when I ended up at the University of Alberta for a postdoc. And I found out that the largest Scientology archives in the world are housed in this university. And I was like, oh, oh, this is wonderful. Because during my research with free and open source software hackers, a number of people had told me that they were involved in protesting the church in the 1990s and that they had released secret church documents, and that, in fact, the very issues I was interested in, copyright and trademark, were actually explored because of the battles that occurred in what is humorously referred to as Internet versus Scientology. And there was a very popular Usenet group in the 1990s that circulated secret church documents, and Scientology went after its critics in a very kind of hardcore fashion. And here I was at the University of Alberta, and I was studying these uh, early battles, but I was actually quite secretive about the project because, you know, Scientology um, is and was a little bit creepy, and they went after academics and journalists. Um, and at the time, what I found so interesting when I was doing the project wasn't simply the fact that Scientology went after its critics, but as an anthropologist, I was interested in the fact that Scientology seemed to be the perfect nemesis uh, for the geek and hacker world. It was like Scientology was the evil doppelganger of the hacker world. Now, I'm going to now offer you one tiny morsel from Scientology that I think will prove uh, very immediately what I mean by this. Hackers have a very uh, particular relationship to science and technology. And Scientology is a religion about science and technology whose relationship to technology could not be more different than the way that hackers treat technology. So I'm going to show you a document called Keeping Scientology Working, which one might say condenses, again, the view um, that Scientology takes on technology. So keeping Scientology working consists of getting the correct technology applied, uh, consists of having the correct technology, knowing the technology, knowing it is correct, teaching correctly the correct technology, <laughs> applying the technology, seeing that the technology is correctly applied, hammering out the existence of incorrect technology, knocking out incorrect applications, closing the door on any possibility of incorrect technology, Ah, and closing the door on incorrect application. And this is, you know, done with no irony uh, whatsoever, right? This, this is the truth. And so what was really fascinating to me was the way that, you know, geeks and hackers in the 90s had found their perfect nemesis. And so when Anonymous came into being, I was like, oh, this is like proves my thesis that once Scientology goes after this population, there is this true enjoyment in, in, in protesting your nemesis. So I decided to start following Anonymous. I was also really just intrigued by that, in, that transformation from you know, these trolls that were living in the kind of underbelly, the underworld of the internet, and that they decided to sail on the ship of activism. So let's now fast forward to 2010. This is April 2010, where the, where the kind of very famous hacker um, 
institution that was involved in politics was not anonymous. It was WikiLeaks at this time. And WikiLeaks released collateral murder. It was provided by Chelsea Manning. And for those that don't know what collateral murder is, it was a US military video that in fact uh, the Reuters news organization was trying to get access to. They had requested it through a Freedom of Information Act and they could not get it. And the reason why they wanted it was this video shows US soldiers gunning down a couple of journalists and children. And it shows the cold-blooded pathological reality of war that tends not to be shown anymore in our news organization. And it really caused quite a bit of um, controversy, and it was something that really put hackers on the political map. At this time, Anonymous was geopolitically insignificant. Now, let's now go to the fall of 2010, September. There was something by the name of Anon Ops, which is an IR it eventually became an IRC server. And what happened was Chinology was still protesting the Church of Scientology. There was still some trolling under the name of Anonymous. But a new wing, a new node came into being. And what was interesting about this new node was, first of all, it wanted to defend file sharing and piracy. That became its issue of choice. But the more significant um, innovation was that they started to use digital direct action in the form of hacking and distributed denial of service attacks to make their political points. These were tactics that were dropped by Chinology. Chinology really stayed within the legal domain. Now, how they came into being was also very much like that accident I just told you about. And I, I don't have time to go into the details, but I do go into it in my book. But very soon after the constitution of Anonops, they come to intersect with WikiLeaks. And it has to do with Cablegate. So Cablegate is when WikiLeaks releases diplomatic cables, again provided by Chelsea Manning. It really causes this huge firestorm. The US government pressures uh, financial organizations like MasterCard and PayPal to block WikiLeaks, it was known as the uh, banking blockade. Amazon also pulled the plug on services. And Anonymous, Anonops, this new wing, comes in support of WikiLeaks um, and basically initiates the largest distributed denial of service protest in the history of the web. So freedom of expression is priceless for everything else. There's MasterCard, right? <laughs> and what is really uh, amazing about this moment well, there's a couple of things. First of all, it was also a bit of an accident. I'll tell you what it was very briefly. Anonops was only going to mirror WikiLeaks like many other uh, geeks and organizations were doing. But someone went ahead and DDoSed PayPal. They probably had access to a botnet. They did it. And then someone in the secret cabal, because there's many, but many cabals in Anonymous, decides to claim that DDoS as a non-ops. And so he went to a blogger and said, that was us. Let the world know that that was us. And then this guy goes back to the little cabal who actually makes decisions through consensus, and everyone is livid. They're going to shred him to pieces. They're like, that wasn't us. We did not make this decision. We're just mirroring WikiLeaks. And then this savvy, clever person said, hey, that ship was sailing. I wanted to jump on that ship. Come on, the media's all over this. Let's just say it was us. And then finally, they're like, yeah, let's say it was us. Um, and then they decide to, to try to claim it their own and also do a lot more DDoSing, right? Again, imagine if that had never happened. And this was quite significant because this detached anonymous from questions of file sharing. Also, what was quite interesting was that the DDoS um, was really only made possible by very cheap botnets that uh, these hackers were renting or had control of. But thousands of people were angered at this blockade. And so thousands of people also joined this IRC channel. There were 7,000 people on one channel. That's a lot of people. Um, there was over 100,000 people who 
downloaded low orbit ion cannon, which was a tool that you can use to contribute to the DDoS. It wasn't necessary, and a lot of people got in a lot of trouble for using it, but it showed or made palpable the kind of widespread discontent that people had with what the government and corporations had done. It was after this that things got really interesting with Anonymous. First of all, this was the architecture that Anonymous took. It, it began to look like a hydra. There were competing political nodes with different political cultures. There were regional nodes in Italy, in India popping up. It really became a complex geography. Um, and then the other interesting element was that Anonymous became anonymous everywhere. This was the time where along with WikiLeaks, they got involved in Tunisia, Zimbabwe, Egypt, Venezuela. It was unbelievable the fountain of activity that was coming out of Anonymous. And following them basically became my life uh, 24, well not 24 hours a day, but you know when I was awake, and thankfully I was on sabbatical that year, uh, otherwise, my teaching would have uh, suffered quite a bit. So then, uh, just very briefly, you know, Anonymous mutates a lot. It changes. And two of the big changes were in May of 2011, a, a number of the hackers who did a lot of the political technical work um, decided to break away and form a group called LulzSec. And the reason why they broke away was Anonymous had become so associated with activism that if they did hacking that didn't have a political purpose, people in Anonymous would get upset. So they decided to break away with their own little group uh, where they would hack for the lulls, for the fun of it. Um, and they went on a 50-day hacking spree and hacked AT&T, uh, Sony Pictures, um, a bunch of video game companies. And it was interesting because even though many of the hacks had no overt political purpose, uh, they were enacting a politics of transgression. They were also demonstrating to the world the crappy state of internet security. And they were a little bit like a performance troupe as well. They disbanded at the end of June. Um, and then soon after, through um, uh, some leftover members uh, created the group Antisec, which, unlike Lulset, became a political, a militant hacker group. Militant in the sense that on Fridays they would try to uh, target the government, for example, and the hashtag for their dump was uh, Fuck FBI Fridays. Uh, on Mondays it was, uh, you know, Monday military meltdowns, right? Like they were really just trying to target governments and security firms. Um, and they, they really uh, went on an on a unbelievable hacking spree. Now, I can't go into detail about all the operations under the banner of Anonymous or LulzSec or Antisec, but to give you a flavor of what Anonymous does and how it does it, I would like to just go in depth for a second in one operation that I think is representative of the different tactics that Anonymous uses in its Operation BART from August 2011. Now this happened after BART officials decided to basically shut off cell phone access in their stations because local activists were protesting BART and the police after Charles Hill, uh, a homeless man, had been killed by a police officer. And so they were protesting... BART is the Bay Area Rapid Transit. Bay Area Rapid Transit, sorry. Um, and they were protesting... Uh, the killing of Charles Hill, the local activist, and the Bay Area Transit was going to shut off cell phone access for the second protest in the hopes of quelling protests. So Anonymous is like, oh, censorship, we're going to get involved. A small team called the Cabin Crew initiates it, Anonops gets quite involved. Like they often do, what they do is engage in an organized street protest. This actually is not from the first protest, this is the year anniversary, but I just like the picture, and it's also um, paying homage to another uh, man who had been killed before Charles Hill. Um, but they also, some people took the initiative, oh, this was also during the protests, and I guess the point I was going to make with this is that though many of their uh, tactics are legal, they like to retain their abrasive uh, screw you, Edge, and I think that this is a perfect example of that. 
So along with protests, uh, some individuals decide to hack into the Bay Area Rapid Transit websites and they release customer data, customers that had nothing to do with the police brutality. And this, of course, causes enormous controversy inside and outside of Anonymous, uh, because generally, let's just say, uh, information is procured through hacking that reveals corruption. Most people Anonymous are like down for that. If hacking has collateral damage, there's a few people who decide to move forward with it, uh, for the purposes of media attention. This lands them literally on CNN, uh, but this act initiated a press release from Anonymous that uh, Anonymous is not unanimous. Uh, and finally, if someone can do something in the classical style of trolling, uh, they often will, if they can. And in, in the case of Operation BART, they were able to. The gentleman who announced that BART was going to shut down cell phone access. His name was uh, Linton Johnson, and he was the public spokesperson for BART, and someone happened to find a photograph uh, of him that uh, was a bit racy and published it on a website called BART Lulls and said, if you're going to be a dick to the public, then I'm sure you don't mind showing your dick to the public, BART Lulls. So I think that this is a really good kind of example of the way in which Anonymous integrates legal tactics, illegal tactics, morally gray tactics in one operation. This is not being necessarily coordinated uh, by the same people, although they may be on the same IRC server. Okay, now I just want to move away from, a, from their history and talk a little bit about their kind of sociology. Uh, and their political significance. I don't have time to go into this, so I'm gonna skip that. Um, so initially, it was, um, it was quite fun to study Anonymous. It was quite pleasurable. Um, it really is an unusual, subversive, subcultural world. Uh, but eventually, this was definitely not a, a mother-cracking game. Um, with over 100 arrests around the world, there were about two dozen uh, people in the United States who were arrested with numerous, numerous convictions. Um, and it's so significant, the number of arrests, again, in North America, in Europe, in much of the world, that a number of the lawyers who are representing people from Anonymous have called this moment the nerd scare, that is something like the Red Scare, where the U.S. government went after and demonized uh, communists during the McCarthy era. And I would like to mention it's not simply just anonymous uh, that is targeted as part of this nerd scare. I think a great example of this is Peter Sunde, who uh, is part of the Pirate Bay, who is currently in jail in Sweden, serving a year sentence simply for running the Pirate Bay. Um, you know, with anonymous, uh, if you're going to have arrests, it also means that there's a lot of snitches. Um, that are obviously going to be within Anonymous. And one of the most famous uh, was this fellow here, uh, Hector Monsegur, who is better known as Sabu, who was part of Lulsec, who had been arrested in June. And the, and the day of his arrest, he flipped and became an informant. And he was really pivotal in catching a lot of the hackers who were arrested in the United States and the UK. Probably the most significant of all of them was Jeremy Hammond, uh, who is currently serving a 10-year sentence for hacking many kind of American corporations. So that's obviously something that's part of the sociological landscape. But what has been interesting is that even though there's been major arrests, even though there's snitches everywhere, Anonymous has not been entirely stopped. Uh, they're quite um, strong and going strong. And um, I decided to kind of make a, a list of ingredients that kind of can help explain the secret sauce of Anonymous's success, and, and here it is. So I think um, part of the reason they're successful is because they have bold and recognizable Hollywood aesthetics, uh, there is a really kind of strong participatory open thrust in Anonymous, which I'll get to. 
They function like an anti-brand brand. brand. Uh, There's a lot of mystique and misinformation that helps create a drama so people want to follow them. They, They land a tremendous amount of media attention. But I think the most important has to do with their unpredictability. Um, and in fact, if there was one word, if I, I had to pick one word to describe anonymous, it would definitely be mercurial. They're changeable, volatile, f- fickle, flighty, erratic, animated, lively, sprightly, c- quick-witted. These kind of characteristics really capture what anonymous is about. And what's interesting is that I don't think that they're random. There's many logics to anonymous, uh, but they're very malleable and fickle and flighty. And this kind of set of characteristics is not unique to anonymous either. Um, In fact, if you know about trickster lore, uh, the trickster being figures like a coyote or Anansi the spider or, or Loki, if you've seen, you know, Uh, Thor, the Hollywood film, tricksters kind of embody these characteristics. And in my book, I do uh, a lot of kind of conceptual work of relating uh, the trickster to anonymous. But these characteristics are really animated by their amazing artwork, uh, which on the one hand is um, functions like memes insofar as there's stock images that are just tweaked and redone so a lot of people can contribute. On the other hand, there is a kind of a lot of artistry that goes into it and their videos in particular, as we've seen, whether it's that first Scientology video uh, or the videos that they create for their operations are incredibly important. Um, Just like with any kind of domain of political organizing, you have to have teamwork um, and that is no different in anonymous and it comes at many different levels. So for example, anonymous is often described as being hackers, 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 and hackers, hackers, hackers. And in fact, compared to something like Debian, actually what makes anonymous distinctive is that many people are not hackers. Many people who show up are students and janitors, video makers, uh, designers, like people with really different backgrounds. And one of the reasons why they've had such a forceful presence is because they're quite good uh, on mediums like Twitter. And one of the biggest activist accounts in the English-speaking leftist world is Your Anonymous News. It's got over one million followers. And this is based and predicated on teamwork. They've had up to 25 people uh, behind the team. There's a style guide. There's rules and consensus they have to follow. There's big dramas. They explode. They get reconstituted, right? Um, so that's really important. And then, of course, lull sec, anti sec. You know, there's a lot of teamwork that goes into anonymous. Another kind of factor behind their success is their openness. They really combine an open source logic. Uh, in the context of organizational obscurity or downright secrecy. And I know that this may not seem like um, a pair that can go together, like how can something be really open and also really secret at the same time, right? Um, And it's because it's two different elements um, that are in play. So really, anonymous is this idea that cannot be controlled. It's free for anyone to take. Uh, And I think it was really embodied well when Jake Davis, uh, who was known also as Topiary, a member of LulzSec, uh, before he was arrested, he tweeted, you cannot arrest an idea. And this is the the only tweet that now stands on that old account. And what this has meant is that you have anonymous in Indonesia, in Singapore, in Canada, right? It really is this commons for anyone to take. And there are limits. Uh, to who can, who can take it. I once heard a good story uh, from some intelligence officers who told me that jihadists actually admired Anonymous for all the media attention they got, but really um, they probably couldn't embrace the idea of Anonymous or, or lulls, right? The cultural differences between kind of jihadist terrorists and Anonymous are too big. Uh, so it doesn't mean Anonymous can travel anywhere and everywhere, but nevertheless, it has real wide appeal and can circulate. And I think the, crystal, the most crystallized example of this 
was when um, Polish parliamentarians who were protesting uh, the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, which was being considered in Europe, well, they protested it. And one of the ways that they protested it was by taking the anonymous mask. Now, they weren't claiming to be anonymous, uh, but by this time, the mask had become equated with popular dissent. Uh, and again, was a symbol that could travel in many different parts in the world, and it was because no one claims ownership over it. However, the architecture of the actual networks like AnonOps is like a maze. It's unbelievably complex. There's cabals within cabals. It makes the cabals in Debian look like child's play in comparison. <laughs> Um, I mean, to give you one example, there was once a channel that I believe was called Kitten Core, which at, at first I thought was about uh, cat porn, but it wasn't. And there was another one called Upper Deck. And they had the same exact people, minus one person, uh, because at the time they were splitting bitcoins, and this was a new person, and they didn't trust them. And so for a while, you have like these two channels that are exactly the same, minus one person, right? And really, the only reason why I've come to know about many of the cabals is because people were arrested and they were able to talk freely in a way that they weren't able to do so before. And even though I've written um, a really big book, I feel like I've only captured like a fraction of this maze. And that's what it really felt like. So now I just want to move to the ethics and politics of anonymity. Um, you know, whenever Anonymous intervenes in a certain area of the world or operation, there's an effect uh, to their operation. But at, at a more meta level, I think Anonymous is really interesting because they came into being just at the moment where anonymity and privacy are truly going extinct and dying and possibly are uh, going away. And sometimes I really do think Anonymous is simply the kind of party at the funeral of, of privacy. You might as well go out having a good time if you're going to do it. Um, but what is really fascinating is not simply that they incarnate visually this importance of privacy and anonymity, but that there is an extremely robust anti-celebrity uh, ethic that's at the heart of anonymous. And I think that there's a real strong virtue in embracing opacity, illegibility, anti-celebrity in the age of celebrity and surveillance. And there were many, many kind of um, examples in which people who were seen to kind of be acting for fame, recognition, or who, was, who were self-promoting were literally kicked out, banished, chastised, thrown to the corner as a result of doing so. This was really a living ethic. And I have many instances, it, instances in my book. And I'll just give you right now a short conversation happening between one person accusing another person who demasked of trying to seek fame and recognition. And again, there's going to be some strong language. So this person says, hey, E, can I say you really love attention or just some wannabe? You know, would be surprised if you're not some faggot fed just like Sabu, who was this person working as the informant. The other person tries to defend himself, say whatever you want, but you, you'd be wrong. And then this person says, you're like this other person on Twitter who seeks attention. Um, and so really, this was something that was really incredibly important. Now, another logic of anonymity that is alive in Anonymous actually has a very long heritage. And it has to do with the fact that speaking anonymously is important for the vibrancy of democratic societies. And this has been um, enshrined in the Supreme Court. Probably my favorite example is captured in an aphorism by Oscar Wilde, um, who says, man is least himself when he talks in his own person. Give him a mask and he'll tell you the truth. But I think that there is a pretty strong sentiment as well that uh, acting anonymously is cowardly. Uh, this is something I hear quite a bit, sometimes when people are critical. But I, I actually disagree. I think that there's good political reasons to try to protect yourself. Um, 
And I think at its best, anonymity puts the attention on the message rather than the messenger. And in many cases, when it comes to political movements, whether it's in the past or it's in the present, so uh, here we have um, Hoffman, who was one of the founders of the Yippies, which is a kind of countercultural uh, 1960s pranking sort of movement, who was made into a celebrity leader, Abby Hoffman. And then there's Julian Assange, who was very much kind of embraced by the media, and Julian put himself in the spotlight. And in both instances, when the leader is tarnished his or her reputation, the whole movement can be tarnished. So there's real kind of powerful reasons why one might want to embrace anonymity in, in political acts. But a final kind of element about anonymous uh, interactions when you're doing it politically in small groups is that there's a great psychological burden uh, when you're interacting with others very closely, but you can't share much about your life with each other. And in fact, some of the hackers who were caught um, simply shared too much about their lives um, because they couldn't sort of hold back. When you are under such intense conditions, you want to talk about your you know, past and your, and your desires um, and what you've done, and, and this is exactly what people did because it's truly hard to remain truly anonymous. And the next quote I'm showing you is from a hacker who did manage to remain anonymous, and he's never been caught. Uh, but he was telling me one day how hard it was uh, to bear that burden. And he said, the hardest is the silence. When we have trouble and stress, unlike family or work tensions, there's no one to talk to, new, no friends who understand or who I'd trust with it. The advantage is that Anons can resurrect. You can go away, come back with a new name if you don't share anything. Uh, for you, he was talking to me, I'll keep following Biela. There's no neck changes for you. And so it is definitely not necessarily easy uh, to work under the veil. So just to finish now, I'm just going to talk very briefly about weapons of the geek and contextualize anonymous within this larger field. Very briefly, this uh, title is inspired by an anthropology book called Weapons of the Weak, Everyday Forms of Peasant Resistance, in which an anthropologist by the name of James Scott looked at interventions like minor acts of sabotage or foot dragging that on the surface do not look political. It's someone being difficult at work, for example. Uh, but his argument is that in the aggregate, they do have political effects, and that in many different peasant societies, uh, there's many different types of weapons of the weak, but they all share some similar characteristics. And in part, inspired by the fact that in the last decade, and especially the last five years, there's been this unbelievable kind of flowering of hacker political activity, I am really interested in what are the points of similarity and differences between, let's just say, the world of free and open source software, radical tech collectives, the pirate party, the whistleblowers, right? What unites hacker and geek politics, and in what ways are the different modalities quite different? And I was really struck by Zach's uh, earlier talk, because on the one hand, I think that there are these two opposing trends. On the one hand, there are these very, very strong forces of depolitization in the hacker world, I think also bolstered by startup culture as well. But on the other hand, there's also been this unbelievable flowering of, of kind of very direct action politics in the hacker world. Um, and so, first of all, just very briefly in terms of some of the similarities, um, some of the similarities, or, or not so much similarities, but one way to account for the fact that we have a kind of explosion of hacker politics today has to do with the fact that courage is contagious, right? You have these very dramatic acts, such as what Chelsea Manning did, giving all this information to WikiLeaks, and uh, what Julian Assange did, and that literally inspired Jeremy Hammond in Anonymous to return to, to political hacking. We know probably that Edward Snowden 
was uh, at least partly inspired by what came before him, right? So these very visible acts, and this is very different from weapons of the weak, which are very invisible. Hacker politics, weapons of the geek are very visible on the other hand. And this visibility has allowed for this kind of um, courageousness um, to be infectious. Now, um, I think there's about a half a dozen characteristics that help explain some of the different connections between something like the Pirate Party, the Pirate Bay, um, Debian, and Anonymous. And don't worry, I'm not going to go into all six of them. Uh, but I'm going to mention one of them. And one element that I do see marking hacker and geek politics as different from other domains is that hackers often work on projects uh, together and their, their different motivations don't get in the way of achieving a goal. So people go to projects for very different reasons. And additionally, their offline political affiliation, like are they social democrats, or are they libertarian, are they anarchists, that tends not to matter so much for many different domains of hacker politics, whether that's Debian or anonymous. And generally, I think that's a, a really powerful thing. And to give you a great example of this in action, I'm going to show a very short clip from a movie on the Pirate Bay where each of the three kind of main people behind the Pirate Bay are explaining why they contribute to this project. And each one of them has wildly different reasons. It's in Swedish, so there's uh, subtitles at the bottom. I actually have to escape it because it's too large. Okay. Mm. Sajten, sajten är en helt tom sida som skapas av användarna själva. Och vi lägger oss inte i vad som finns, finns på den. Nej. Det vill säga utrandefrihet. Ja, jag skulle snarare betrakta det som från ett rent tekniskt perspektiv att det är en ren förmedlingstjänst. Förmedlingstjänst? Ja. För kommunikation? Ja. Jag bryr mig verkligen inte om ideologin bakom piratkopiering eller upphovsrätt eller någonting. Eller politiken. Jag gör det här för att det är jävligt kul att driva en stor sajt. Vad är det viktiga Pirate Bay gör? Det demokratiserar väldigt mycket och det skapar en bra förutsättning för yttrandefrihet. Vad har det med det upphovsrättsligt skyddade materialet att göra? Det som Pirate Bay gör är att helt enkelt göra det möjligt för en enskild individ att dela med sig av material. Även om det är upphovsrättsskyddat? Ja, det är en tråkig följd, följd problem av det. Det tycker jag man måste diskutera. Okej. Så, de är under oath. Um, I just like that slide for weapons of the geek. They're under oath. I have no reason but to believe them. The first person is interested because he wants to run a, a neutral political, um, a neutral communication infrastructure. This, and by the way, Anakata is another person who's been caught up in the nerd scare. He was in solitary confinement for quite a while. I'm not even completely sure why he's in, in jail, but he's someone else who's in jail. The middle person, um, is into it because it's fun. And then Peter Sunday is like, this is political for me. And I see that in many different domains of hacker action, you have that kind of extreme flexibility and malleability. And I actually think that this is generally um, a really positive thing. But there are some limits to it as well at times. And this is what I'm gonna, I promise, finish with. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting uh, with weapons of the weak, uh, I mean geek, um, you have these very different domains um, like free software, like anonymous, like whistleblowing, and there's these amazing moments where they cross-pollinate. And I'm going to show, to finish, uh, a video by Edward Snowden who basically uh, videoed into hackers on planet Earth, and he basically pays massive homage to free software installment, and he talks about the importance of creating um, technological tools for the fight against surveillance. And basically, he's issuing a call to arms. And the question now is, what free software developers, what Debian is gonna do in response? And there seems to be a strong need to bake in security defaults 
that provide enhanced privacy um, to protect and enable things like crypto so that governments cannot so easily snoop on the population. And I think that this is a really important call, but one of the things is that this can't necessarily arise magically, uh, but needs to be a kind of concerted effort, if not for a whole project, at least a team in a project in order to make it happen, where basically different motivations um, need to align in order to make it happen. But again, what I really like about this uh, final video that I'm gonna show is that different areas of hacker politics do cross-pollinate, do come together, do speak to each other. And again, Snowden is a perfect example, uh, but the limits or the problem is that he's just an ind individual who did a tremendous amount by exposing this kind of blanket surveillance and the kind of close relationship between corporations and governments. But he's very well aware that there are armies of geeks and hackers, and it is they who could find, who can finish the kind of um, job that is necessary to restore privacy. If not, we're definitely just going to be at the party at the funeral of anonymity and privacy. So to finish, I'm just going to uh, play the video, and then I realize I've gone over time, so we can just uh, break it up. But if people have any questions or comments, I'll definitely be around afterwards. Uh, topic, and I, I think when we talk about whether or not the government begins going after journalists, this is the real sticking point for me, because in terms of my political philosophy as it relates to technology here is, uh, I, I would say, almost Stallman-esque. Um, when we think about free software, when we think about free software, uh, we need to think about software as a means of expressing our freedom, but also defending our freedom. Governments rely on the same technologies we do. They adopt the same standards. Uh, they use the same products. And this happens worldwide. So the solution to that, uh, when you ask me, is whether or not the United States government can manage to uh, behave itself, to restrain itself against violating the Constitution, against uh, bringing suits against journalists, against uh, limiting the freedom of the press, other governments will make different decisions. And if we want to live in a better, more enlightened world, what we need to do is we need to remove those capabilities from the governments by enshrining our rights into our means of communications, by denying them those capabilities, at least on a massive, untargeted level. Because, you know, you can't pitch a zero day at every mobile phone and every computer that's out there, or it's going to get caught. It's going to get caught by a researcher, and it's going to end up on, you know, uh, The Verge, or Ars Technica, or any one of these other sites. Um, and there's going to be a post-mortem of their malware, and it's going to be reused and repurposed. They're going to find it out, and they're going to be traced back to you. Um, but governments can still pursue their legitimate needs for law enforcement, for intelligence collection, on a targeted basis by using those zero days only when they are the least intrusive and essential means of getting... Okay, so he, he goes off a little bit, but I just wanted to end there and just thank everyone for uh, the work they do. And again, I'm um, going to be here all week, so if you have any questions or comments, I'm, help, I'm happy to engage and take them. Thank you very much.